So it's, uh, despite the, the rain, um, it's a, a real pleasure to be here uh, in Amsterdam uh, and to have a chance to share some of my views about uh, the platform economy and the future of work. Um, I teach uh, labor law and employment law at Harvard, and I have spent um, a lot of my time over the last year or two thinking about the ways that labor and employment law intersect with the gig economy and the ways that the gig economy is impacting labor and employment law. The blog that I edit on labor.org reflects the critical nature of these questions to the world of work and the world of work law. A huge percentage of our coverage has concerned the gig economy and the future of work. With the time uh, that I have today, and in a partial attempt to consolidate some of what's already been debated here, what I thought I would do is to ask and then address the following question. What is it that a progressive jurisdiction, one that is concerned with the interests and lives of gig economy workers, what is it that such a jurisdiction should do? In Europe, that jurisdiction might be a nation or a city, in the United States, for better or worse, that jurisdiction today can only be a city or a state. But whatever the level of lawmaking, my question today is what should such a jurisdiction do for gig economy workers? Given recent developments, particularly here in Europe, I should say at the outset that my approach to this question is not the one that London, for example, has pursued, although there is some appeal to that approach. Rather than kicking Uber out, to coin a phrase, I want to explore how a progressive jurisdiction might live with Uber and other firms like it in order to live with those firms and in the interests of workers. To get at the answer to this ultimate question, we need to explore two others. The first is, what do gig workers need from law? And the second is, how should our progressive jurisdiction structure the law so that it gives those workers what they need? So a quick caveat before I get going. I'm a product, I think as we all are, of my own national context. And I am steeped in American law and the debates about the gig economy that have unfolded in the United States. Those debates will of necessity frame my presentation today, but nonetheless, I hope the arguments that I plan to offer apply across borders. So, to start with an outline. What do gig economy workers need from law? I think there are three basic categories. First, they need what we might call minimum standards protections. These are the very basic minimum rights that everyone should enjoy. Second, they need a collective voice and a right to engage in some kind of collective negotiation with the platforms on which and for whom they work. And third, they need some kind of protection from technology-related job loss. We need law to be there when driverless cars replace Uber and Lyft drivers. So, three sets of needs. How can the law of our progressive jurisdiction provide for these needs? Again, I see three basic approaches. The first, what feels like the most old-fashioned, but in my view, probably the best for the time being, is to treat gig economy workers as employees and to expand the protections available to employees, especially with relationship to technology-related job loss. That's the first option. The second option is don't treat gig economy workers as employees. Allow the platforms to continue to classify the workers as what we in the States call independent contractors but then change the system of benefits for independent contractors, including by providing a set of portable benefits and by allowing collective bargaining by independent contractors. 
The third approach is to create a hybrid legal classification for gig workers, something in between employee and independent contractor, something that currently does not exist in the United States but is prevalent here in Europe. Okay. Start then with what gig workers need from the law. Like all workers, those who labor on digital platforms need a set of basic protections. I think we might want to add a thing or two to this list, but it certainly includes minimum wage and overtime pay. It includes protection against discrimination based on race, gender, including gender identity, religion, national origin, sexual, sexual orientation, disability, and age. It includes a physical working environment that is safe and healthy. It includes unemployment insurance of some kind, some guarantee of income replacement if and when work is interrupted or disappears. A type of workers' compensation, some kind of insurance and income replacement when there are injuries arising out of the job. Health insurance, paid sick leave and paid family leave when time away from work is required because of one's own illness or because one has to care for a family member, paid vacation time, income security in retirement. As I say, we could discuss the exact particulars of this list, but there should be no question that gig workers, like all workers, need and are entitled to this set of minimum standards. Now, as I say this, I am aware that for m many items on this list, these are provided socially in Europe, not as a matter of the employment relationship, but elsewhere they are provided through the employment relationship. That is to say, if they are not provided through the employment relationship, they are not available at all. Okay. Moving beyond minimum standards, gig workers also need from law protection for the right to organize into unions and to collectively bargain with platforms. This protection serves two critical goals. The first is a democratic one. It is through collective organization, and in my view, only through collective organization, that gig workers can secure a voice at work. Only through collective organization, that is, can gig workers democratically influence the terms and conditions of their own work lives. That democratic value is an essential one, and it must be available not just in the traditional economy, but in the gig economy as well. The second goal of collective organization, of course, is an economic one. Minimum wage and overtime pay and, uh, and the other minimum standards I just listed are important. But in order for gig workers to claim more of the economic rewards of the platform economy, they need collective organization and collective bargaining. In other words, in order to ensure that the platform economy contributes to economic equality and does not continue to exacerbate economic inequality, gig workers need unions, broadly defined, some form of collective organization. And the law needs to offer them a, a way to get there. Okay. So, minimum standards combined with the right to unionize and to collectively bargain are the two primary sets of legal rights that gig workers need. But in my view, that's not enough. And now we begin to move beyond the traditional contours of labor and employment law. It's not enough to ensure minimum standards and collective rights because there is a very major threat that major pieces of platform work in the future and in the near future will be performed by robots and not by humans. The platforms, of course, make no secret of their ambitions in this direction. The race to develop driverless cars is well underway. It is funded by firms including Uber. And the goal is quite explicitly to replace human labor with machines. We can debate whether that is or is not a valid goal for the firms. But for our progressive jurisdiction, for our legal system concerned with the needs of workers, the question, the profound question, is what to do about the humans who are today working on platforms, 
but tomorrow will have no jobs. And it is a serious abdication of law's responsibility not to address this question. In my view, it is a serious abdication of labor law's responsibility not to address this question. Law needs to contribute at least to the discussion, if not to the solution, of the problem of technology-related job loss. OK. I think it's relatively easy to do what I've just done. That is to say, what gig workers need from law. What a progressive jurisdiction that aimed to ensure the needs of gig workers would do. It's harder to decide how our progressive jurisdiction could or can or should provide these workers with what they need. I think the most obvious way to do this is also the proper way under current law. And I say this knowing that there is enormous appeal to doing something new, especially in circles, intellectual circles, academic circles, where technology is, is a part of the conversation. There is an enormous appeal to critiquing the old for being old, to critiquing the traditional for being traditional, and to embracing the new merely because it is new. But in my view, so much can be done by treating gig workers as employees of the platforms for who they work. Let me use, uh, as just an, as, as an example, Uber, Uber drivers under US law. And, and when we take questions, I'll be very happy to, to discuss and to learn how this is a limited example. But under US law, employees are entitled to a whole host of labor and employment protections that contractors do not get. The test of who's an employee and who is not is a bit Byzantine, but it mainly resolves to the question of who gets to control the manner in which work is carried out. If the platform is calling the shots, we have an employment relationship. If the driver really gets to operate as an independent business, then we've got an independent contractor. On my read of US law, Uber drivers, like most gig workers, are employees. Think about it this way. If an Uber driver ran her own business, she might decide only to drive to and from, she lived in Boston, Logan Airport. She might decide that's the most profitable way to run a car service business. And she would certainly set her own rates. She would decide when to pick up passengers and when not to. But as an Uber driver, she can't do these things. That's because Uber has significant control over the relationship over the way the driving is carried out. And that makes, an Uber, that makes Uber an employer and Uber drivers employees. Now, it's important to stress that despite what the platforms will argue, there is nothing inconsistent between employee status and flexibility. Flexibility is a virtue, I agree. It's a virtue for consumers, it's a virtue for workers, and it's a virtue for firms. And if I thought that calling Uber drivers employees would kill flexibility, we'd have a big problem. But I don't think it does. One can be an employee and still have enormous flexibility at work. For example, and again under US law, a worker can set her own schedule and operate entirely without supervision and still be an employee. Okay. I stress this, again, for two reasons. One, flexibility is an important value, and we want to preserve flexible work relationships and structures. I take that as a positive development of the gig economy, a positive way in which work is being reshaped. But we don't want to lose all of the minimum standards that I listed at the beginning. We don't want to sacrifice those on the altar of flexibility. 
And there is a way to have both, in my view. And that is to understand the employment relationship, the legal definition of employment, as capacious enough to include the kinds of new work relationships we are seeing in the gig economy. Okay. If I'm right, and I really think I am, <laughs> then gig workers are employees and ought to be classified as such. Once they're so classified, they'll be entitled to most of the minimum standards protections I've outlined. Europe, as I've already uh, uh, alluded to, does a much better score on this than the United States and other jurisdictions. In the US, it's not even enough to say Uber drivers are employees because employment status in the United States does not get you paid sick leave, does not get you paid family leave, does not get you vacations, does not get you a pension. Right? So if we were really trying to build a progressive jurisdiction for gig economy workers, for any kind of workers in the United States, we'd have to add all of those things. Okay? And we'd also need to make changes to our labor laws to better protect workers' right to organize unions. We need to protect the improvements made recently to our healthcare system, which are, as you know, very much under threat. And as I'll go into more detail below, we need to come up with an approach to technological unemployment. So all of this is just to say, employment status in the US, huge step forward, but nowhere near enough. Okay. If, on the other hand, our progressive jurisdiction does not treat gig workers as employees, but continues to treat them under US law as independent contractors, our progressive jurisdiction would need to make significant changes to the system of benefits that we offer independent contractors. At least in the US, the protections that we offer independent contractors are essentially nothing. So there are three kinds of changes consistent with the three kinds of needs I outlined at the beginning that we need to make. The first concerns rules governing the conduct of work itself, okay? For example, there is no reason why workers classified as independent contractors should find themselves without protection against discrimination. Do we really think that only employees deserve protection against gender or race-based discrimination? The same is true about workplace safety and health protections. These are guarantees that all workers should enjoy. And so if we want to treat gig workers as independent contractors, we ought to expand the scope of anti-discrimination laws and the scope of safety and health laws to cover independent contractors. That is, the, the rules that govern the conduct of work itself. But then there are those minimum standards that are more about benefits than work. This is the set of, 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 of uh, standards that are more often provided socially in Europe than in the United States. Things like unemployment insurance, health insurance, workers' comp, paid sick and family leave, vacations and pensions. If those things are not provided socially, that is that's to say they're not provided as a matter of citizenship or residence, if they're provided through work, we need to attach them to the independent contracting relationship in the gig economy. And here, the right approach in my view is to move in the direction of a portable benefits system. The details, of course, would have to be worked out, but the basic idea is as follows. Every platform would contribute some amount of money per ride, for example, or per, per delivery or per hour worked to a fund, a benefit fund. Every gig worker would have an individual benefit account that they would own and that they would maintain regardless of their work for any particular platform. The benefits would therefore be portable across platforms. If you drive for Uber today or, and Lyft tomorrow and uh, uh, do Instacart or Deliveroo the next day, all of this work would result in contributions to your personal account in the Portable Benefits Fund. 
The system would offer those things that employment law now generally provides. Again, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, health insurance, retirement benefits, and the like. And because the fund would operate on behalf of all platform workers, it could purchase insurance plans at competitive rates, like employers now do, and it would be universal, available to all those who work in the platform economy, not just those who met the legal definition of employees. Now, just a note for those who are interested. Some progressive localities in the United States are already considering the adoption of portable benefits programs. In Washington State, on our west coast, the legislature is considering a bill that would require any business that acts as what the bill calls a broker for more than 50 individual workers, that would be any platform operating in the state of Washington, would have to require, would be required rather to contribute to this portable benefits fund. The contributions required by the law uh, would be substantial. Platforms operating in the state would pay 25% of every fee earned, or $6 for every hour worked, whichever is lower, into the fund. Workers would then be able to use the funds to buy workers' comp, health insurance, paid time off, and retirement benefits. Now, you, you, it should be obvious, but you'll see what, what the idea of the Portable Benefits Fund is, is to give independent contractors access to that set of benefits that employees have as of right. right? If we can't classify, or if we decide not to classify gig workers as employees, we leave them as independent contractors, but we set up this fund to replace those benefits that employment law provides. Okay. Another move we need to make if we're to maintain gig workers classification as independent contractors concerns unionization, unionization and collective bargaining. The problem here, again as exemplified by the United States, is that antitrust law, what you may call competition law, bars independent contractors from unionizing. That's because the law treats independent contractors like they're independent businesses. And so collective bargaining among them is just price fixing. And it's illegal. But if we don't really think that Uber drivers are like independent businesses, and we don't think it would be price fixing in the negative sense for drivers to demand that Uber lower its take rate, then we need to do something about the antitrust problem. We need to create a carve out from antitrust statutes for gig workers. In the US, also in Washington state, the city of Seattle is experimenting in this direction. Under a new local ordinance that is a city law, gig workers in the transportation industry, so that's Uber and Lyft drivers, who are classified as independent contractors, now have a right to organize a union and to negotiate with the platform over rates of pay, with the ultimate rate setting to be approved by the city government. Okay? Now, the ordinance is subject to a set of legal challenges, all of which are playing out in US court. Um, the theory behind the law is an excellent one. In the US, we have an exception to antitrust law for what you might think of as heavily regulated industries. That is, the government, including a state or local government, can replace competition with regulation. And because the taxi industry is one of those heavily regulated industries, Seattle is arguing that it can set rates through a collective bargaining process, so long as the ultimate approval for the rates comes from the city government. Okay. The details are probably less important than the basic idea. Gig workers classified as independent contractors deserve a right to unionize. And we therefore need a legal approach to dealing with the antitrust, to dealing with the competition problem that arises when you allow independent contractors to bargain collectively. Once we resolve the antitrust problem, 
Um, there's another legal question to address, and that has to do with the form of worker organizations that gig workers should be permitted to form. This may actually seem strange, a uh, strange question in Europe, um, but it's very much alive in the United States. Uh, and, and let me just say a word about why. Our labor law gives workers a binary choice. Either bargain individually or bargain through what we call an exclusive, represent, represent, exclusive representative collective bargaining union, one that represents all the workers in a given workforce. Absent from the labor relations landscape in the United States are things that are like very common here, including uh, works councils. Um, US law actually makes those illegal. So when we think about collective uh, organization and collective work for gig workers, we need to think about what that structure would look like. And I think the basic point is to be open to new forms. Right? It doesn't need to be a traditional union. It might be. Uh, but there's, what we need is some way of collectivizing uh, worker voice and worker power in the gig economy without running up against uh, the antitrust problem. OK, now, I've been holding off on what might be the hardest question to address. Uh, and that is a way of protecting gig workers against technology-related job loss. I've been talking about this a lot. Um, it's important to say technological unemployment isn't just an issue in the platform economy. Uh, some economists, as, as everyone in this room knows, estimate that half of all jobs are subject to automation in the near future. But the threat is acute in the platform economy, maybe most particularly so in the transportation, transportation sector, where again, firms like Uber are working around the clock to replace drivers with driverless cars. So what could our progressive jurisdiction do here? Is there anything? I think there are several possibilities. And let me list them in order of theoretical and political ambition. The first idea uh, popularized by Bill Gates in the United States, but also I know by Maddie Delvaux in the European um, Parliament, it's known as the robot tax. The idea is to identify moments when human labor is replaced by machine labor and to impose a tax there. If mechanization is efficiency enhancing, such a tax will essentially take part of the gains from mechanization that the firm would otherwise enjoy and transfer them to society. Presumably, the revenue from the tax could then be used to do things like provide for unemployment benefits, provide for retraining and reskilling, and provide for counseling service to those who lose their jobs. There are nascent attempts to create such a tax underway in progressive US jurisdictions. In San Francisco, uh, a woman named Jane Kim, who's a member of what San Francisco calls the Board of Supervisors, which is essentially the city government, city legislature, created initiative, an initiative called the Jobs of the Future Fund that would tax employers every time they replace a human worker with a robot or an algorithm. The revenue from the tax would then be used to fund job training, education, and investment in new technologies. So as with all of the ideas I'm, I'm throwing at you today, in my view, the details are, are, are less important, although ultimately would be quite important. The basic idea is if we are going to mechanize hundreds of thousands of people out of work in the name of efficiency, which we may want to do, all of those gains should not be captured by the firm. And a way to do that is to tax it and to transfer some of the gains through society back to the workers. A second idea, in my view, even more ambitious than the first one, is to provide equity or ownership rights in platforms to the platform workers. One such mechanism would be offering share ownership to gig workers. 
A company called Juno famously made a move in this direction when it, when it offered preferred stock options to its drivers. And although that particular experiment did not come to fruition, conceptually the idea of share ownership is quite attractive. My colleague Richard Freeman has written that if gig workers have an ownership stake in the platforms, then they will share in the gains of technological development even as they lose their income stream from work. Along these same lines, we might think more imaginatively and push to restructure existing platforms or more plausibly create new platforms with just straight up cooperative ownership structures, platform cooperativism. This would, of course, vest all ownership rights in the platform workers and would thus enable them to reap all the rewards of technological development. For this, we have examples of uh, the leading example of worker co-ops here in Europe in the Mondragon region of Spain, uh, and also a uh, much smaller scale in the United States where several taxi companies are actually already structured in this way. My home state, Massachusetts, has this remarkably sophisticated worker cooperative law. It's known as Chapter 157 of the Massachusetts Code for people who are interested, which allows for the formation of such worker-owned cooperatives in the state. It's not used <laughs> uh, hardly at all, uh, but it's there um, and could be used in this context. So again, the bottom line, if workers own all or part of the platform where they work, they not only um, suffer the losses that come from technological development, they also share in the benefits uh, that come from it. Okay, before I close um, and turn it over, um, I just wanna mention one other idea relevant to the question of providing for gig workers legal needs. Um, and that is the idea of creating uh, an intermediate category, something between employee and independent contractor for gig workers. Many European jurisdictions already have such a third category, sometimes called dependent contractor, sometimes called worker in the United Kingdom. Uh, and there is a fierce debate uh, in the United States about whether we ought to create one. Um, the debate, I should say, was fiercer <laughs> before the last election. Um, I think uh, in, the con in the current context, there is um, very little optimism that the creation of a third category would be um, of any use to workers. Um, but when there was a more progressive government in the United States, there was this debate about whether we ought to create one. Um, I was on one side of that debate. Uh, it remains unresolved. Um, I should say that the appeal of the third category is clear in theory. In theory, if gig workers kind of have some attributes of employees and they kind of have some attributes of contractors, which they do, the question is, well, why not create an employment definition that captures this kind of hybrid characteristic of the gig economy worker? There are, however, some problems. The dependent contractor category is generally meant to apply to contractors who do most of their work for a single entity, 50% in some jurisdictions, as much as 80% in others. The idea is to capture the dependence of the worker on a particular platform. That doesn't capture the reality for many gig workers who split their time between multiple platforms. And it doesn't capture the kind of spirit and idea of the gig economy, which is to work across multiple platforms. Probably more important, creation of a third category creates this very serious risk. And it, this would ultimately be an empirical question that would differ dependent on jurisdiction, how it would play out, but the risk is that we create this third category and we don't see independent contractors shifted up, so to speak. We don't take independent contractors and give them more rights that obtain in the hybrid category. Instead, what we do is we see employers shifting their employees down. 
into the new category, and so losing protection. I can say, having spent many years in the United States doing this kind of work, that is a very significant risk at home. I'm curious, maybe we'll have time to talk, whether it feels like a risk here. Just to put it bluntly, the risk is that the third category won't help gig workers. It'll hurt janitors and home care workers who aggressive employers will want to reclassify in order to avoid the responsibilities that come from employment status. That would be a negative development and one we ought to avoid. As I've said, my own view is that gig workers classify as employees and that the definition of employee is capacious enough, at least under the law that I know best, to accommodate the kinds of flexible work arrangements found in platform firms, to accommodate the kind of flexible work that we want to nurture, but that we want to nurture in a way that doesn't require the sacrificing of basic rights. Okay, so at the end of the day, our progressive jurisdiction has a number of choices available to it, assuming that we can get the politics in order. Um, the course I believe we ought to pursue is to protect gig workers as employees while expanding the range and quality of the protections that we offer to employees uh, and I look forward to the next presentation and to your questions after that. Thank you so much.